Cool, okay. So today, we are on the subject of word and worship. And they are two things that, you know, when they're split, they really split the church. When they're split, they split the church. When word and worship are split, it splits the church. They belong together. How do they relate together? How do they build the spiritual resilience of the people of God? The resilience of the people of God. That's what they're for. But to build the strength and the resilience of the people of God. Now, of course, I know we don't need to be too worried about you know, being resilient because our lives are together and organised, right? And our spiritual life is a cakewalk and a unicorn just chopping past the window. Okay? <laughs> Paul has been writing to a church under pressure of its circumstances, and we identify. Don't we? It's a church that's been in a thriving place, situated along the main trade route down the fertile Lycus Valley, leading down to the busy port of Ephesus on the Mediterranean Sea, through which port the world had laid open at these people's feet. But times had changed. The road had been moved northwards to Laodicea. To run through that place. And the business and the money and the jobs, the prospects and the young had departed. And Colossae is now a place living in disillusionment and living on its memories. Through a recession, which wasn't going to lift. Tell me that doesn't have a huge spiritual impact on anybody's life. <coughs> of course it does. Oh, we're supposed to be more spiritual than that, and it's all the new... Mm hmm... That's the land of the cloud and the cuckoos, isn't it? When you get into that sort of experience, it puts pressure on your own spiritual life. It puts a pressure on your own walk with God because it's put a pressure on you. And it's not like you've got this soul that sort of floats on in, in a sea of tranquil peace and then you've got your body which does something else and is afflicted. Humanity is a psychosomatic unity. That is to say, you can't separate your spiritual life and the circumstances that affect the rest of your life. They, they interact with each other at least. And these people are in this situation where their circumstances had affected the way they thought and felt and were. So that when somebody comes along and offers them something new and flashy and a way to feel better about themselves, based on human pride rather than on the word of God, based on some esoteric experience and some legal observance and whatnot, to make them feel they were a cut above the rest, well, they'd go for that because they felt they'd been pushed down pretty hard by the circumstances that they were in. Is that making sense? Into their situation, a bunch of Judaizing proto-Gnostic heretics had brought them false hope of a new dawn. And they were vulnerable to it because of the way their circumstances had been allowed to affect their spiritual lives. Esoteric experience, religious ritualism, legalism, and a pride-based way of feeling better about themselves. And Paul has dealt with that error so far in this way. He's been correcting their questions, because they're asking the wrong questions. The big question, Paul seems to be saying, is not, what are the rules? But just who is this Jesus I'm supposed to be following, chapter 1 of Colossians? And who should I be conscious of having become in Christ, chapter 2 of Colossians? And how should I therefore be behaving, chapter 3 of Colossians, and that's where we are now. He does that, how should we conduct our life? He does it in terms of what we must pick up and put on. He's explained we are to kill off in verse, uh, what we're what we to pick up and what we're to put off, rather. He's explained what we're to kill off in verses 5 following, put off in verses 8 following, and what we're to uh, <coughs> put on instead, verses 12 following, showing how it arises out of who we become in Christ. So last time then, putting on, he dealt with letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. If you weren't here for that, then the videos are available online in the usual way. 
Last time he dealt with letting the peace of Christ rule in your heart. This time he deals with letting the word of Christ dwell richly in you. And next time he deals with doing the deeds that can honestly be done in Christ's name. So he's dealt with the peace of Christ. Today he's dealing with the word of Christ. And next time he's dealing with the deeds of Christ. Making sense? This time he says, <coughs> let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. No, so it's all about the word of Christ this time. Dwelling in you richly as you teach and admonish one another. That's what you do. With all wisdom. That's how you do it. And as you sing. Yeah, singing. Psalms, hymns and songs. Spiritual songs. With gratitude. Again, that's how you do it. In your hearts to God. So you can see from the way that that's laid out, he's majoring on how Christ communicates to his people in his word and forms our lives together. It's crucial to keep on hearing from Jesus. You will not be resilient as a Christian in a world that constantly shouts its way in our ears if you're not constantly hearing from Christ. Is there some rationality in this? This making sense. You can throw cushions. You might be tempted to throw chairs from time to time. <laughs> Let's stick with cushions. Um, does that make sense to you? The world is always shouting in your ears. There's always propaganda being pushed at you. It's not like picking up your Bible and you're sort of just telling yourself Christian propaganda to try and make yourself believe it. It's the fact that you are constantly bombarded. And from time to time, for short periods of the day, you actually let the other side have a word. We need to make sure we do that. Otherwise the propaganda tide is going to sweep us away. We will not resist the propaganda of the enemy of souls if we don't keep our own radios tuned to the Ministry of Information in the Kingdom of God. Right? How to do that? Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. I, I could have had a three-bed semi, but I felt moved towards a Celtic roundhouse. Mm -hmm. I, I have no idea why, it just looked like a nice picture. So there you are, the Word of Christ dwelling richly in your Celtic roundhouse. Local and temporal reference. But there it is. Just as the Colossians were urged in their personal, well, their distressed personal circumstances, to let the peace of Christ rule in their lives, verse 15, now they're being urged to let the word of Christ dwell richly in them. His peace and his word running in parallel. Funny that, isn't it? Funny how that works. Peace in his word, running in parallel, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's an unusual expression. Two things to consider in particular. We don't usually speak about the word of Christ, do we? What do we say? The Bible. The Bible, thank you very much. That's called sabotage. Um, what, else, what else do we call the Bible? We call it the word of... God. Yeah, exactly, thanks. Okay. <laughs> there we are. Part of your gift here is a bit, you see things differently, it's marvellous. Um, so yeah, the word of Christ, that's all. Why say that? And then, how on earth are we going to understand that dwelling bit, let alone the richness? So the word of Christ then is used here, instead of the word of God. The word is the way it's put in chapter 4 verse 3, just the word. The word of God, chapter 1 verse 25. Word of the Lord, in 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Paul speaks in different ways about the same book, a group of books. But in Colossians, Paul is emphasising the person and work of Christ. And in any case, here in this short passage, it's Jesus' peace, Jesus' word, Jesus' deeds that Paul's trying to get to focus on to make him spiritually resilient. It's all about Jesus, he's saying, isn't it? Interesting that the words can be used interchangeably, though. Because there's no division in whose word it is. God's word, Jesus' word, the word inspired by the Spirit. Remember we were saying a few weeks ago, Paul's pastoral method is to seek to strengthen the inner man by teaching truth and building spiritual strength to resist heresy and strengthen their resolve to live in the truth. That is pastoral purpose here. He's saying, I want to build you strong from the inside out. We can talk about the ins and outs of the academic arguments about the heresy and all the rest of it. But actually, I want to build you strong. It'll be plain then. It'll be obvious then. It'll be clear then. There won't be a problem with heresy then. We're going to see how he seeks to do that to make that sustainable. By the way, did anyone know? Nobody saw my Friday post on Facebook. Uh, it's about um, how Jesus dealt with the sinful and adulterous woman at the well. 
he didn't go into a diatribe or into a long discussion of the, of the health hazards or the problems associated with open marriage. He, he didn't deal with what the law says about an immoral lifestyle. What Jesus did with the woman at the well was that he offered her living water instead of the emptiness of what she was experiencing and looking for fulfillment and things that just don't fulfill and don't satisfy. He said, here's what satisfies. I'll give you living water. He started out by offering that instead of unsatisfying sin. I'm ready to give you living water. And Paul starts here by strengthening the Colossians' spiritual life and dealing with what they need and what will actually satisfy them. And of course, feeding our minds with Christ's word is the key to strengthening our souls in the faith. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. What's going to strengthen you? Faith comes from hearing and the message is heard through the word of Christ. It's not that the word I keep on the cupboard beside my bed magically strengthens my faith as I sleep. It's that hearing it, hearing, not using it, not referring to it, not spicing the, 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 the sermon with a few scatterings of bits, but letting it speak to my heart. That ministers Christ into my soul. Christ's word dwelling in you. There's an unusual expression. Again, getting the word of Christ dwelling in me. Now, I've got to tell you, for any preacher, I mean, and for me now, a chasm of temptation has just opened up my feet. Because I would love now to take some time to expand on how you can go home and embrace seven shades of useful, practical, wise, helpful, spiritual disciplines so that the word of Christ, the word of God, will dwell in you richly. Right? I'd love to do that. I'd love to talk about um, the discipline of a structured pattern of daily Bible reading. You know, I'd love to talk about that now at this point. It would be great to be justified in doing that. I'd love to be able to sort of talk to you about you know, the things you can get on your phone these days. BibleGateway.com has got a marvellous app, you know, and you can get your daily verse and you get sort of a list of calendar daily readings in there. I'd love to be able to talk to you about that on the basis of this verse, but I can't because some of this is about it. I'd love to share some of that with you. I'd love to talk to you about something Di Hanke was saying recently on his Twitter feed where he was talking about the discipline of not, open up, not opening up his social media in the morning until he's opened up the Bible. Yeah? And the interaction he had around that one was saying, look, you can get these apps at the moment, so you can roll over in bed, switch it on, and there it is, first thing. You know, fantastic. I'd love to talk about that, but that's not what this is about. I'd love to talk about scripture memory plans and, and Bible memory, you know, <coughs> all that stuff. I'd love to talk about the wisdom of being able to take some time out on a Sunday afternoon to perhaps study some biblical theme or word or or whatever, and how useful that is in getting the Word of God into your heart and into your life. I, I'd love to do that, but it's not what this is about. Because this is all about housing God's Word, Christ's Word, together. Together. In truth, I'm not too upset about that either. This verse is all about Christ's Word dwelling in His people, absolutely plural, plural as they gather together for worship that's what this is about now of course that's not going to happen unless you've got those other things in place in your life as it is unless you come to church prepared to minister God's word to one another together it's not going to happen unless you've got your daily readings going on unless you've got your scripture memory happening unless you're taking some time to study something that's of use and interest in more depth unless those things are going on but the grammar dictates it that you here is unequivocally of the group of them. And the context requires that as well. This happens in the context where they are the body of Christ together, explicitly God's building, housing his word, and where they commonly, corporately sing to one another. Now, it's got to be the gathering of the church for this purpose then, because they didn't have Skype. Okay? And they weren't singing at one another down their mobile phones. He's talking about when you come together, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you do something else. And we've read about it already, we know what it is. It's the singing and stuff that's going on. We come together for what? We come together for the two W's. Word and worship. And just as W's are double U's, did you get that? Mm -hmm. right. So these are two... Okay, let me just spell that out, because there's head shaking. <laughs> you have a W, isn't it? It's a W. 
A double U. Two U's. Two U's. Bah, bah, not those U's. <laughs> These U's. That, that joke's getting old now. It is. No. So, <laughs> <coughs> two U's. Double U's. The W's are word and worship, and they belong together, unequivocally, inseparably, together. Let's look at the dwelling bit, and it will all become apparent. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, or indwell you. Now, this isn't bed and breakfast we're talking about. This isn't the occasional visit. This isn't your foreign summer package holiday abroad, a place you visit once and never go back. This is taking up residence to stay. It's not a camping trip. Balmy days and freezing days. Summer sun, autumn rain, winter blizzards and gales. It's actually a little more serious than that. When you trace this sort of idea through Paul's theology, a richer seam of the working gets exposed. What are you talking about? This word, enoiketo. Let the word of Christ be housed in you. That word, enoiketo, only crops up as a metaphor in the New Testament. It's a bit of picture language. It crops up six times, and all of them in the Pauline books. So God himself will dwell among his people, 2 Corinthians 6.16. And Paul is quoting Leviticus. He's quoting Leviticus 26.11-12 in the context of God putting his tabernacle amongst men. It's God coming to dwell amongst his people. It's the time, it's the point, where the great Shekinah cloud comes across the tabernacle or comes across the temple and God takes up his residence. In his temple. See, there's a richer scene here, isn't there, behind this word dwell. So the Holy Spirit dwells in believers, Romans 8 11. In 2 Timothy 1 14, the Holy Spirit lives in his people. It's about a permanent home, a residence, living there properly, Monday to Friday, 24 7, 365. As God came to dwell in the tabernacle in the wilderness or the temple of Jerusalem, when they were filled with the cloud of God's glorious presence. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word of personality and does what the Spirit does, dwelling in every believer. And we might come back to that in a minute. But first we need to come to the second word that's of really great significance. Hear that word you. See that word there, humin, on the wall in red? There it is. Enoket. Enoketo. Oh, enoketo is because it's in sentence, yeah. Enoketo is a verb, right? In you and humin. You. It's often been taken, so often been taken, I mean in your heart. Like, you know, Psalm 119, 11, I've hidden your word in my heart. I might not sin against you, it's great. But in this context, in Colossians, that word in you is definitely plural. There's no way around it. Paul is speaking in this context, using this syntax of the gatherings of the people of God. Let's be clear here. i have said for the sake of balance, unless your own spiritual life embodies God's word, unless you're taking God's word in and feeding on him, unless you're coming ready in that way for worship. Some people come for worship expecting to be entertained, not prepared to build it like their engineers. You know, they come to be entertained like the audience, not to put it together like a bunch of engineers. And actually we need to come with our tools and our kit, because we're going to build worship here today. Does that make sense? Have I got a strange mind, Chris? Is that, is that very patently obvious? But you can see what I'm saying. It's the way it goes. It's serious. We need to come for that because that's what strengthens us and builds our resilience. And we'll fall into the trap of the disillusioned people of God under pressure of Colossae if we don't work on this. See, they hadn't built their hearts up strong in the Lord by ministering to one another from strengthening God's word. And the disillusionment of their circumstances grew too strong for them. So they were susceptible to getting cheap thrills from somewhere else. And along came these heretics. And said, here you go. And look. The point is not just to get God's word dwelling in you, basically. The point is to get God's word dwelling in you richly. Zach was interested in reading the Bible. He wasn't taking any chances with the rumours of its double-edged sword potential. Keep it at a distance. You want the word of Christ dwelling in you, plural, and you want it richly. 
So that looks as if he might be happy of worshipping in a congregation where he could trust the word of Christ would reliably dwell there poorly. Doesn't he? You find people like that? You know someone like that? Happily spiritually unwell. Happily spiritually weak. Cherishing their weakness in the word of Christ, delighting to be briefly in churches that encourage a lack of sacrifice, faith or enthusiasm. It's the word that makes you faithful, strong and resilient. It's weakness in the word that makes you weak. Let it dwell in you richly. Now hang on, because the English translation here is much less than helpful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. This is a third person singular imperative. Yes. I knew you'd like that. <laughs> I'm telling you that because it's not a great way to convey it in English, but I'm going to have to go back over it. An imperative is something you must do. You've got to go and do that. <coughs> but the dwelling is not being done by you. It's being done by the Word of Christ. Yeah? So that's what makes it difficult to convey in English. You need to do this. We're told to do this. Scripture says do this. And if it's not a matter of personal Bible reading plans and scripture memory charts and devotional aids, we're left with a big question. Paul, okay, we're going to let the word of Christ dwell in this richly, Paul, that's great, we're going to go for that. You made it clear that's an imperative, we must do that because we've got to be strong. We want to be resilient, we want to be resistant to the pressure of the world and the flesh of the devil, we need the word of Christ to dwell in this richly, we've got it. We've got that, how? How are we going to do that? We want to be strong in the word, how are we going to actually be? You know as well as I do, it's very easy, it's very possible to go along to you know, a big preaching ministry or go along to a big or hear somebody else. Oh, it doesn't have to be, but you know, that can be the tendency. And we feel we've really heard a sermon. Huh? Sort of he used a lot of words I didn't know. Huh? He talked about the Greek a lot, whoever that Greek was, I don't know. Yes, right. Yes. Everything's going to Yes. Amen. Great. Well, actually, there's a shock coming here because Paul is not saying go along to the conference. He's not saying get in here, you know, I don't know, it's, it's invidious to read off big names that come from America or something. Or even from the UK. He's saying, be strong in the word, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you do something so simple as sing. There is in Paul's setting out of things no divorce between word and worship. None. The word is ministered to one another as we sing together. Now he's not saying you've got to sing operatically like the lady in one of those hymns you were listening to. He's not saying you've got to sing, you know, with a very great deal of sort of rhythm and bass, you know, drum and bass. Mm -hmm. right? He's not he's just saying sing to one another. Crows and canaries. <laughs> The Word of God is in action. It's in, to be in action in this congregation for two things. Firstly, for edification. In action for edification, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We'll come to some of these phrases because they're not well translated. With gratitude in your hearts. Too. The Word of God is in action amongst us for edification by this means. To teach. Didasco is the word for teaching office in the church. It's teaching. It's serious. Teaching. How do we teach the faith? Of course we teach it when the pastor gets on his hind legs on Sunday, but if that's all the knowledge to be biblical teaching, then we certainly haven't got a biblical view of teaching. Here the gathered congregation, we will think of a Sunday morning. Hear and receive God's word, taught by called men, yep. Yeah. But they also hear and receive teaching from one another and they receive it in that interesting way. The word of Christ dwells richly in the heart of the congregation as they teach and admonish one another by singing in a way that's interesting indeed. Teach and admonish. When you come to church, I come for a good ticking off. What does admonish mean? Nutheteo is the word. 
It means being confronted with the truth in order to correct. And we come to God's word to be corrected. Now, this is really important because <coughs> you wouldn't always think so. But I need to be corrected. Do you? I mean, I'm a sinner. You can consult my family, they'll tell you. It's true. And I need to be corrected. By God's word. And we come together around His word to have this purpose fulfilled for us. If you, if you go to church week after week after week and the shoe never pinches, you're going to be growing some pretty big bunions there. Something's wrong. And that happens for us as we sing. <laughs> Something, isn't it? As the word of Christ dwells in us, as we gather together, as we teach and admonish with all wisdom, as we put that word into action in worship. How? Oh, with all wisdom. As we worship. The word of Christ dwells in you richly as a congregation, used in edification as we worship. How? Worship how? By praying prayers that are aimed at the next man, putting him right? Not at all. But as we sing, singing. Now that's a real problem. Singing has got such a, a, a dodgy history in the churches in Wales. Isn't it? Some scope for it going wrong. The chronicles of God's work in Wales are littered with disasters that have arisen out of singing getting out of place. And Paul is much more specific about this singing by means of which we get the word of Christ dwelling in us richly for the benefit of mutual edification. What are we saying? What are we to sing? Oh, that's an interesting question. That's a question we're used to, isn't it? What should we be singing in church? Go around and get a different answer from everybody. I we had a great get on him there today, and there, there are those missing today who would have, you know, really like that. Uh, last week David was here, we had some more tricky funky stuff. You know. Be quite glad to hear, you know, this week or something. We, we, we all have different tastes, don't we? And Paul is saying, look, there's these different sorts of songs here. And you can just see that some members of the congregation at Colossae would hear the first word and go, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. oh, not the second one. Mm. Not the third one. What are we to sing? How big a question is that? Well, says Paul, first of all, you are to sing psalms. Psalm voice, it's the word used by Luke of the Old Testament psalms. It may, I mean, 1 Corinthians and in Ephesians, it may have come to be used as a type of song rather than a song taken from the volume of Old Testament psalms. Paul seems to use it in that way. Certainly not exclusive to, to the Old Testament Psalms. And there are people out there today, plenty of people out there even to this day, who hold to a doctrine of exclusive psalmody. Have you come across exclusive psalmody? You are blessed. I am. Um, well, this is the only thing you can sing. is Psalms from the Old Testament. You mustn't sing anything else. Because they are biblical. Yeah. And, and some of us are going, oh. some of us have heard of singing. We're being, oh. Very crude. But please note, Paul is saying, yes, sing those. He's not prescribing the form, but the function. And the function will get us straight to the mode, but that's coming. There are those who look at this verse with the three sorts of songs, and they read it saying we should be singing psalms, psalms, and spiritual psalms. But it doesn't say that. It says we should be ringing psal singing psalms and hymns. Hymn nice. Very general term in biblical literature, any festive hymn of praise as in the Greek translation of Isaiah 42, for example. It only crops up in the New Testament here, and in Ephesians 5.19. So people who say there's a biblical warrant for singing hymns and hymns only, you ask them where it occurs in Scripture. It occurs in two places in Scripture, whereas there's an awful lot of Psalms, and there's an awful lot of something else as well. Because Paul goes on from talking about Psalms and hymns to old ice. Old guys, what are old guys? It sounds like old, doesn't it? It is. It is. I don't all think of Frankie Howard. But, but it is the common song, okay? It is the common song. That's what it is. It sounds like a much more freeform sort of song. We don't know what Paul's song book would have sounded like, but there are those three categories of worship song listed here by Paul. They're by no means clearly delineated or specified. They, as Lucy says, they, they represent all the forms of singing that the Spirit prompts. All sorts of songs. I tried to make sure there was all sorts today. I think there probably has been. 
In an age like ours that is so dominated by worship form, it is so easy to miss what the Apostle is saying. Because while we're bound up tight with considerations of form, Paul is preoccupied with issues of inspiration. What we've got here is this. He's talking about psalms, hymns and songs. All of them inspired by the Spirit. So he says, singing psalmois, hymnois, odois, pneumaticais. And his emphasis is it's got to be Spirit inspired. Do you see the point? Now it says spiritual in the NIV. It's not what that dative means. What that dative means is inspired by the Spirit. Spirit inspired worship. <coughs> now wisdom is crucial and thanksgiving is crucial the loss of thanksgiving from God's people makes them horribly spiritually vulnerable as does the loss of wisdom but we looked at that sort of stuff two weeks ago here's how it is to be when we come together our coming together must be characterised by the word of Christ dwelling richly in our, in our fellowship and in our time together. As we pray together, as we sing together. Edifying and prompting worship. Yeah, using psalms and hymns and songs, yeah, 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 but inspired by the Spirit. When Mike quoted us a, a, a hymn in his prayer, I thought, oh, I want to find that, I want to, I want to sing that, I want to find that now. I looked at my hard drive and it wasn't there. Oh, what a nuisance, great is my faith in that. Great, just the right thing to put in at that point, isn't it? So here we go. Word and worship, together, dwelling in you richly, as you come together, performing this function in the life of the congregation, edifying and drawing your hearts out in relationship to God in worship. Edification and worship standing on the same ground. And the word permeates both. Both teaching the word and admonishing it are founded and established in and on the word, which is to dwell in us richly as we do both singing psalms, hymns, songs inspired by the Spirit, founded and established in the word, which is to dwell in us richly as we do that too. And please notice that all these things do not belong to either the worship leader or the pastor teacher. They belong to the church which exercises all its gifts together, including those of the worship leader and the pastor teacher and a few others as well. These things belong to the body of Christ, all of us, within which we, the body of Christ, recognise various gifts as the Spirit gives them. I, I, I don't know the answer to this question. Here's a, here's a question. Tell me that. I don't know why this is. But Scripture seems to acknowledge the gift of pastor teacher, but not the gift of the admonisher. Now maybe human flesh and blood just couldn't bear that sort of gift because it would be an awful thing to have to live with, right? Or to be. What would it make you as a person? But there it is, that's the case. So the rich indwelling of the Colossian Christians with the word of Christ should be made manifest in mutual teaching and admonition as the Colossians gratefully sing spirit-inspired songs to their God. And that is there to make them resilient content and satisfied and adequately supplied in their God to resist the things that would damage their walk with God, their spiritual lives and their hope of glory. How important are these things? How important are these things? To be there in a common life for any one of the people I think you should sing. Would that be a good idea?